Hello and welcome to Sunday Politics, reaching you live from our global headquarters here in Nigeria's Commercial Nerve Center, Lagos. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. I hope you're having a great weekend, which is about to end, by the way, for you to resume work. I know some people don't want to resume work, but hey, you have to do what you have to do. But anyways, today's program is back with serious issues of national concern and interest. And within, within the time we have, we'll explore all of it. Just yesterday, the pro-Yoruba uh, nation agitators invaded the Oyo State Government Secretariat and attempted hoisting their flag. In fact, they did before the situation was brought under control. That brought anxiety uh, all over the place. What exactly is going on with secessionist movement in the country? We'll explore that issue with a security expert. Also, it's been 10 years since those over 200 innocent schoolgirls from GSS Chibok in Boronu State were abducted by Boko Haram terrorists in Boronu State. And as at the last count, some have either escaped or have been rescued. However, a third of that number, that comes to about 92, are still in captivity. What's the hope that they will come back? We speak to those who are close to that story. Plus, Nigeria has recorded successive decline in its oil production in February and March. What does this mean to our economy and the nation's macroeconomic outlook? A professor of petroleum economics will break it down for us right here on the show. So you can see it's a packed program. Within the time we have, we will do justice to all of this. So, hey, whatever you do, just sit down, relax with your family. It's a family show. Let's find out exactly what's happening in the polity as we explore all of these issues as time will allow. But first, let's tell you that the president of the Senate, Gospel Akbabi, has asked the All Progressive Congress in the South Side Geopolitical Zone to work harder so that, the, so that the visibility of the party in the region will grow from state to more state. Uh, Mr. Akbabi, or Senator Akbabi, I should say, gave the charge while receiving them in courtesy visit, the APC chairman from South South Region in Abuja today. Senator Akbabi, who explained that he understood the challenges being faced by the chairman, assured them that in the days ahead, a meeting of critical stakeholders will be convened to work out modalities to support the party at various state chapters. He commended the APC chairman for their visit and used the opportunity to intimate them on the plans of the tenable led administration towards economic prosperity agenda for Nigeria as a whole and the South South in particular. Now, away from that, in the meantime, the governor of Ondo State, Mr. Lokia Yedatiwa, says there is no vacancy to be filled in the Oyo State uh, Ondo State Government House as he not only stepped into the shoes of his late boss, but he has also proved to be a worthy successor in his word who will build on the reforms brought in uh, by the governance of his uh, principal, who is now late. Ms. Aida Tewa, who is on the local government tour across the state ahead of the governorship primaries of the All Progressives Congress on Saturday, April the 20th, says is optimistic of clinching the party's ticket. The tour of local governments begins in Ondo West local government, with the governor visiting the traditional ruler before meeting party faithful to energize his base ahead of the party's governorship primaries on Saturday, 20th of April. The train then moves to Ileoluji Okeibo. I've never seen this kind of love and support, but since this is the second local government, I'm sure other local government will repeat the same thing. I represented here unit leaders and men, the women, the men, the youth, all of them are here to receive me, to pledge their support. Before now, about a month and a half ago, they did a similar thing by mobilizing themselves to endorse me to continue as governor of Ondo State. But today they've all come out on this local government tour to express the same openly. The final destination for the day is Ondo East local government area, where Governor Lokei Datua expresses confidence he will be the party's flag bearer. Early on Friday, the governor had flagged off his local government tour at a federal local government area where some party stalwarts spoke about the chances of the governor ahead of the primaries. By the grace of God, comes by this time Saturday, Lucky Olimi son Ayeda Tiwa will have been declared the winner of this primary. If federal had been lost to Governor Lucky Olimi son Ayeda Tiwa, 
is a place where he is loved thoroughly and he has also demonstrated affection all the way for the next five days. We're excited about what is about to come. I think Odo State has seen the difference between uh, a sitting governor and an ordinary aspirant. People love him and it's natural love. The campaign is set to move to Akura North and Idare local government next. I did tell you that it's a park show, but that is a campaign, so more like local government campaigns ahead of the primaries that will be held uh, by the APC uh, for ahead of their November elections. And the incumbent governor is trying to seek uh, that office fully uh, come that particular month. But I did tell you that uh, three things are in focus today on the program. One is the oil production that has dipped uh, in February and March, according to data from OPEC, as well as the students in captivity, plus the issue of the invasion by sessionists, the pro Yoruba nation agitators uh, in all your state. But first, let's uh, get in that conversation uh, on the particular issue of uh, crude oil production. Uh, as soon as we establish connection with others, we'll get to talk to them. But first, let's talk to Professor Wumi Iledare. He's a professor of petroleum economics and policy research and the Director of Energy Information Division of the Center for Energy Studies. Uh, he joins us from our Buddha studio. Professor, thank you so much for coming on the program. Prof, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. I don't know if you can hear me, though. All right, absolutely. I can hear you loud and can clear you hear now. Me? Uh, welcome, welcome to the program. I can All hear right. you loud and clear. All right, so let's get to this All right, particular... thank you. Absolutely. So uh, we saw the numbers that in January we, we recorded 1.4, according to OPEC uh, report, and in February it went down to 1.3 as against 1.2 in March. And this doesn't look good according to our target for the year. What do you think is responsible for all of this? Oh, well, thank you very much. I think... Uh uncertainty, uncertainty, and investment decline, and uh, vandalization, and competitiveness in the other places where you have more volume, the cost is lower. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we, we, we thought PIA, we, we, we kickstart things. But uh, basically, what, what was going on is uh, investment uncertainty and there are so many competition for the amount of uh, money available to expand uh, oil and gas production and so we we need to to go back to the table look at the intent of the pia and the beyond the letter of the pia and then realize that uh, business as usual will not grow our production and so we we need to do something better than what you are doing now the reason why this conversation is important, uh, Prof, is the fact that when you look at our budget assumption for 2024, a lot of things are benchmarked on oil and its production. 1.7 is a projected number, and we're looking at 78, although we're doing over 90 for Brent at the moment, so we are in excess, uh, as well as uh, our projection for our GDP growth, which is 3.7, but we're doing 3.4. So when you look at our macroeconomic outlook, basically, there's a lot that depends on this fundamental. The central bank is doing a lot uh, to push in and make the Naira rebound. So what do you think is the implication of this particular decline on our economy at, in the very short term? Well, well, thank you again for your question. And it's not that people are not told about this uh, overtly optimistic production figure. Uh, if you go back to history, since we peaked in uh, 2005, at about 2 point something million barrels per day, we've come down. But let's find solutions. If we are, what we are doing right now is not going to take the economy to where it's supposed to, to, to go. Uh, basically, there's nowhere in the world where you are going to have 37 billion barrels of oil and you are producing 1.7 million barrels per day, or even 1.35 million. It's not that we don't have the reserve, but the investment to build the capacity is not there. 
Meanwhile, the, we have maturity in our production, and we need to understand the difference between marketed production and technical production. Uh, quite often, we base our budget on technical production and not market production, and those are the issues. So now, where do, how do we go from here to do something? Listen, if we are going to target incentive, it must be based on output expansion, not new development. Right now, we need to find a way to expand production. And the PIA has so many incentives there to expand production. And we don't seem to coordinate, in my opinion, the, the three anchor institutions must come together and they must go beyond the letter of the law and follow the intent of the law. All these uh, here and there type of things will not help. Let's go back to the basic. Don't just blame vandalization. Let's look at the infrastructure to evacuate this oil from the reservoir. We are not targeting incentive to those aspects of the industry. If we are going to get out of this uh, cold cooler, if I can use the word, <clears throat> we must integrate the value chain. It's not about upstream alone. The midstream must be also put into the equation as well as the downstream. Now, with respect to the short-term implication of not generating a lot enough dollar, we can see it. Honestly, that's why I accepted this. I went to the bank yesterday, and what I saw is depositing dollar instead of withdrawing dollar. I do not see all this idea that unless you sustain dollar with borrow money, we are going to be able to grow this economy. I would rather borrow money to expand production capacity. That will stabilize the current unstable exchange rate. And that will remove the uncertainty that is actually clogging out the investment that is required to expand the capacity. To me, it's about the future more than now. Anything you do now must put the future in what I call upbeat. Because if you have upbeat now and the future is compromised, we are going to go back to the same place. We must find a way to encourage expanding production capacity to evacuate the 37 billion barriers that we have. And it has nothing to do with the dollar exchange rate. Because the people investing in the oil and gas industry, they are spending dollars. They are not spending Naira. So this is why this conversation is important, because it's a fundamental that has to be put in check, else every other that is subject to volatility and is out of our control uh, will be even more difficult. So, but let me read out the response when this shortfall was reported by OPEC, the response of the Minister, for, Minister, Minister for, of State for Petroleum Resources, Enekin Lekwobri. He said the reported production shortfall was primarily due to issues encountered on the Trans-Niger pipeline, coupled with maintenance activities carried out by some oil companies operating in Nigeria. The issues have been adequately addressed, and production is expected to return to its previous levels in the coming days. Those were his words. But you had talked about something slightly different. How do, what do you make of this remark by the minister? Those are short-time political expediency statements blaming uh, people should come to no this is what i've told people and maybe i can sell it understanding is deeper than knowledge uh, quite often if you are going to manage the industry you can't manage it on the basis of knowledge yes maintenance issue but you have emphasized that be before now what i'm saying is that about the maturity of the reservoirs that we have in nigeria yes we have 37 billion but investment is required. I think I sent you a graph of the production decline in Nigeria since 2005, and it's been going down, and reserve was going up. How come reserve was going up, but production is going down? So the fundamentals are very important beyond just finding an excuse for an industry that is mature, for an industry that has competition more than before. Nigeria used to be the bride 
where people are falling upon themselves to invest and build production capacity. We are no longer there. And now when we build a fiscal system that we expand capacity, what you see, in my opinion, and please forgive me for that, everything is governed in Nigeria now by production, what I call political expediency. This group of people, they want something, you give it to them. Another set of people, they want something, you give it to them. That will not expand our production capacity. We need to be able to confront the investors. Make sure whatever they are asking for, we add value, not only within the short term, but in the long run. Listen, I've been a participant in this industry for over 40 years, and I have good understanding of what ought to be done beyond knowledge. To me, if we do not let go of political expediency for this industry, the industry will continue to go down. That is the essence of Petroleum Industry Act. By now, two years, later, we should not be complaining about not meeting our OPEC quota with 37 billion barrels of oil reserve. We created a production allowance. People did not take it and went to the back to get natural gas allowance by executive order. No, we need to give allowance that we bring up the production now, in my opinion. Now, let's quickly also look at some of the things we need to do and quickly so. Okay. We need to bring the indigenous company onto the table. And we should not be giving out block for more or less creating millionaires. If we want quick output, get the indigenous producers to come to the table. Ask them, what do you need to expand your production? Yes, we can still go through a building process that is competitive. But there should be nobody who did not understand the industry that should be given an oil block or a marginal fuel to expand production. So, uh, Prof, this is Prof, the new Prof, if I may button. era that PIA brought to us. Prof, Prof, if I may button, are you saying that there are people that were given these licenses that don't have the expertise? Is that what you're saying? No, don't, I, I don't want to be, I, I want to be careful with my word. But yeah, look at the number of marginal fuel that has been... Yes, that's what I'm inferring. Don't give block to people that are not technically competent who can increase production within the next six months. This is possible because the results are there. And we just need to look at some of the fields that have not produced over many years or over many... And then find out what could be done. Let me give you an example of what we did in Louisiana several years ago. When there was need to suspend civilians' tax for okay. those who can use horizontal drilling to re-enter wells. And look at what happened in Louisiana. There were devolving gas production. Those are the things you need. And this is where I have concern with the Ministry of Petroleum Resources with respect to the capacity building that is required. I expected the two ministers to have find a way to get technical people in that ministry that can de develop policies that will enhance production within the next six to seven months. Those are not difficult things. Since PIA was passed, instead of scrambling for position, we occupy positions. If they have put technical people together, I'm telling you, we're not going to run into this place. The last administration was too much in a hurry to appoint people without necessarily thinking about the consequences of that. That is right, what we're going through right now. We Prof. need to have people, not only those who have the knowledge, but those who have the understanding of the industry to help us to expand production. Otherwise... Prof. Yeah, my, my apologies. Uh, because of time, we have... We, we don't want to follow. I, I didn't get that, Prof. No, I said otherwise we are following the path of Venezuela. Okay. If we don't do something to arrest this decline. Okay. Prof, there is one issue that is popular among an average Nigerian. Some may be over the top uh, in terms of this conversation. Uh, we are not technical people. All of us are not technical people. But there is one we are very familiar with, which I want you to speak to as we wind down this conversation on this deep, which has to do with vandalism and uh, a breaching of our pipelines. I remember listening to Mele Carey, the GCEO, uh, of NMPCL, and he mentioned the fact that 
when I was speaking to the National Assembly, I think last year, over 4,000, almost 5,000 illegal connection on our pipelines. That means for every 100 kilometer of the pipeline, there are 300 insertions. This is why it's words. When you look at the NATI reports, NATI says stolen crude oil between 2009 and 2020 stood at about 619 million barrels, valued at $46 billion. That, that is even bigger than our reserves. Look at the number of vandalism, over 7,000. I just threw these figures. Uh, since you're the expert, what can we do to at least reduce this as much as possible so that it can help ramp up the level of production we desire to be besides the technical end? Thank you again. This is where the rule of law must come to bear. Don't reward criminality. There's no way to tell me that Nigeria cannot stop vandalism. Again, that is where you need to obey the law of the land. Do you know there's what we call a pipeline act that actually look at breaking pipeline as a criminal activity? You must enforce the law. No nation can attain development if the rules of law are violated. And that's where you're going to call your security people to order. How can you have security agencies being unable to bring to bear the consequences of breaking the law? So the first thing we need to do is to make sure we enforce the law. And there are so many ways we can enforce the law. And that's where, in my opinion, the Petroleum Host Community Fund can play a part. When people begin to realize that if oil is not produced, you are not going to get allocation, people will act up and make sure that they actually police bad behavior in their community. And that's why some of us continue to advocate that maybe, and I don't think it's unconstitutional, that maybe we begin to find a way to recalculate our oil and gas derivation fund and base it on a fiscalized point rather than the well head or the marketed end. Thereby, okay. <clears throat> if a state is not producing at the expected level, they could be penalized. You must find a way to sanction misbehavior. And if there's a time to do it, this is, this is it. This is it. Well, Otherwise, this oil production will continue to slide unless we find technically technology in particular to solve some of this problem. And that's why I would suggest this is where our university is very key, which we have abandoned. Okay. We must uh, find a solution to some of this problem, and we must find it quickly, looking at those who actually understand the working of the industry, uh, beyond those who just have a facial knowledge of it. We well, must thank you, Professor of Petroleum Economics and Policy Research and the Director of Energy Information Division of the Center for Energy Studies, Professor Wumi Ledari. Thank you so much for bringing insight to this subject matter. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, appreciate your time. Absolutely. You're welcome. Well, the reason why we needed to explore that conversation, if you look at every budget that we have, there are targets. There are things that are known as assumption for the people who understand economics. And oil production output is critical because that's where we get most of our forex uh, when we sell crude oil. So if it dips, whatever the central bank is doing on the monetary side uh, may not be well supported from the fiscal side. If the fundamentals like this, which is under our control, is not ramped up, we're expected to go 1.76 according to the federal government. But right now, we have gone as far low as 1.2. That means with the excess we are gaining, now $90 per barrel as against 78 that we estimated in our budget, we're not really making as much as we should. That's why that conversation is important. Let's shift gears now to another issue, which has to do with what happened yesterday in Oyo State. The Secretariat was breached yesterday by pro Yoruba nation agitators, and they even attempted or literally hoisted their flags. They have been brought under control as we speak. So you can see some of them being arrested right there, taken away from that vehicle. They invaded the secretariat, tried to 
breached the security situation in the State House of Assembly, attempted breaking into the governor's office. It was a brazen situation that the police describes as uh, treasonable uh, at the end of the day. That's why we need to find out what exactly is going on with secessionist movement with this Odwa uh, nation in, in, in focus. Let's bring in our expert now, Mr. Kabiru Adamu. is the CEO of Beacon Consulting Limited and a security expert. Mr. Adamu, thank you so much for coming on the program. Um, Jeffrey, good evening. Good to see you again. We're here again on this particular, on issues like this. Uh, maybe you help, I'm sure you've gotten your intel as to uh, how all of this played out, but help us unpack what you think played out in the battle yesterday. Um, so, I mean, in simple terms, like you've described, it's a group of people who committed um, treasonable felony, as it were. They attempted to uh, take control of a state government secretariat and simultaneously went uh, on air to declare uh, a nation. Um, what we've not been able to establish is where that declaration um, occurred. But from all indications, it appears it occurred outside the shores of Nigeria. Uh, so it appears it's a combination of some local players who uh, most likely would have been indoctrinated or perhaps were led to believe using most likely black magic of their invi invisibility. And so they literally walked into the secretariat um, thinking that whatever the security forces do to them will not uh, prevent what they wanted to do. Um, but then a, a group of both uh, the police and the military responded and we know that um, arrests have been made and investigations are ongoing at the moment. Um, some names have come up, including the self-declared leader of the movement. Um, and I'm hoping that the security forces are currently investigating um, all of this to come up, to put a picture to, to the puzzle. Because like I said, there are local players and most likely international players. Another aspect that is also extremely surprising is the number of weapons at their disposal um, the good news is that they were all uh, pump ac action rifles. Um, if those guys had had access to more sophisticated weapons, the story would have been different. Um, the ammunition, apart from the weapons themselves, the, the quantity of ammunition at their disposal was quite disturbing. Um, this ammunition were not manufactured in Nigeria. The weapons were not manufactured in Nigeria. They came in through the borders and someone dropped the ball, how they were allowed to come into the border, how they were allowed to plan all of this, how they were allowed to reach the point where they attempted to invade the, uh, the secretariat. All of these are puzzles that I'm hoping that the managers of our public, public <coughs> security um, space will unravel. All right, Mr. Adamo, uh, we're, we're due for a break, I understand. So we're going to take this break, but well, we're going to stay on that particular issue you raised, which is a number of things that were recovered from them. Three pump action guns, 229 uh, live cartridges, two expanded cartridges, 67 cutlasses, five bulletproof vests, six pairs of boot, 10 megaphones, uh, seven belts, and uh, even what they call the 11 Old War Nation Army camouflage uniforms, and a couple of other things. We want to find out what is responsible for the proliferation despite the effort of the federal government? We'll come back and join that and, start, and continue with that conversation. Please join us again. Welcome back. We want to get in as much in this conversation as possible. Mr. Cabrera Demo, security expert, is still with us talking about the invasion of pro Yoruba nation agitators yesterday in Ibadan, the Oyo state capital, at the seat of power, literally, the secretariat. That's where the hub of administration happens. Mr. Adamo, I did reel out the, uh, the things that were recovered. And, and I'm wondering, despite the effort of the government with legislation and pronouncement and all of that, why do we have this level of ammunition still coming into our country? So far, I want to emphasize that what you reeled out um, is just a tip of the iceberg. But remember, we're at the preliminary stages of this development. Uh, there were two arrests, the military arrested and then the police arrested. And sadly, uh, I think each side is bringing out its information and not they're not bringing out the information jointly. So by the time they harmonize all the arrests, all the weapons that were recovered and several other things that were recovered, uh, what you just reeled out would be a tip of the iceberg, um, unfortunately. Now, your question. Um, 
for a very long time now, I think since 2012, um, ECOWAS has recommended for the establishment of um, a commission for the mopping up of small arms and light weapons in all of the member states. Nigeria is the only ECOWAS member state at the moment that does not have that commission. What we have instead is a center that is domiciled at the office of the National Security Advisor. And that has a lot of challenges. I, I don't want to go into that. And then you also have another uh, body that is existing almost illegally. And I say this because there is a legislation that has been sent to the president waiting for the pre presidential accent. That, that ac accent has not been gotten, but then that body is still operating. And you have someone who is heading the commission who's, who is, you know, as, as it were, functional. So we, we essentially do not do not have a functional commission for the mopping up of small arms and light weapons. Um, the center is doing its best. It has established re, um, regional offices uh, across all the six regions. But then because it's not yet fully operational, like I said, it's operating under the Office of the National Security Advisor. It does not have a budget. Um, the Office of the National Security Advisor is an advisory office, not an operational one. So it's limited within its capacity. And, and I'm urging the current administration and the 10th Assembly to please move quickly in terms of ensuring that we have that commission so that we have an independent right. body that has the capacity to mop up the small arms and light weapons. The police is doing a component of that. And then you also have the military sometimes doing that, and as well as civil defense. But these are all disjointed efforts that do, that cannot produce the result that we want, given the all challenge right. of light weapons that we have in the country at the moment. All right. One of the things we, we must strive to achieve is how to avoid a resurgence of this. We understand that even the Oshun State government is taking proactive measures to make sure this doesn't happen. Afeni Ferry has condemned this move. Uh, I also read somewhere that uh, Sunday Igboho, who is the leader of the pro-nation, has also absorb himself of all of this. So how do we stop this from happening again, this level of brazen assault, if you will? Um, Jeffrey, in simple terms, intelligence, intelligence, intelligence. Uh, we need to increase the ability to harvest and use intelligence. Uh, these things don't just happen in one day. Uh, a lot would have occurred before what you saw yesterday happened. And that the echo space of what happened yesterday had different indicators. I talked about black magic. Uh, I talked about uh, involvement of foreign players. Um, I talked about the use of the cyberspace. So all of these are places where intelligence can be harvested. And that intelligence needs to be made actionable. And so I'm hoping that the presidency, in fact, the president should pick up uh, an issue, a task in order to the several departments that have responsibility for gathering and disseminating intelligence um, so that they are able to pick up these things at the early stages. They, you remember, the essence of intelligence is to forewarn. And once you forewarn, then it is expected that action will be taken to prevent uh, a reoccurrence. Um, of course, um, I, I mean, anyone who knows the Oyo, the Oyo State Secretariat, I know that Secretariat, it's well guarded. The physical security component in that Secretariat is excellent. And so I'm hoping that that is what prevented, uh, you know, what could have happened yesterday. I'm not sure of the other five um, southwestern states, whether they have uh, the type of physical security at their Secretariat. And remember, it's not just the Secretariat. The media houses, uh, the government offices, the residence of the governor. So there, are, there is so much that, as a nation, in terms from a national security perspective, we need to wake up from our slumber. Strengthen intelligence, strengthen cohesion, cooperation and collaboration between the various players within the security space. And all, more importantly, we, we need to get the buy-in of the people. Um, they are the ones who can support the provision, as it were, of intelligence. So just to one quest, quick question, if you can answer me in 30 seconds. I, some, because intelligence people like you uh, have reasons to look at all sides. Why do you think that is it happening in all your state? Um, for a lot of reasons. Um, Oyo State re used to be the regional capital of, of the Southwest. Uh, it, the, the, the recent uh, secessionist movement is also rooted in Oyo State. So it's likely that whoever is behind it capitalized on the sentiments that have been evoked by the early, uh, especially during the immediate past administration. 
Uh, of course, it would have been symbolic if they were successful in Ohio State. It would have reached out. And then we, we, we shouldn't even also forget the fact that um, of the Southwest state, um, Ohio before now was the only PDP state until recently Ocean joined. So all, all of these are likelihoods. And of course, the border uh, in Ohio state that allows the proliferation of such weapons into the country is also another factor. Mr. Cabrillo Demo, CEO of Beacon Consultant Limited, a security expert, thank you so much for always coming through when we need your services right here on the program. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And then we're going to take a quick break. When we come back after this break, we did tell you 10 years down the line, today exactly is 10 years since those Chibok girls were abducted, about 200 of them. Now, the truth is, and the facts, is the fact that um, 92 of them are still in captivity. Is there a hope? Is there a hope inside for these ones? They organized a bit of a prayer session, hoping that um, maybe divine intervention, also calling on the government to do something. Because until those girls are brought back, the parents who don't know whether they are dead or alive, they never have closure. That's the next conversation after this break. Join us again. Welcome back. If there's a girl who was 18 in 2014, exactly April the 14th, 2014, by today, she would be 28. That means if she had finished her school, gotten into the university to pursue a degree, and she chose to do a first degree, a second degree, and even a PhD in quick succession, by now probably should have been a PhD holder. But that is not to be for about 92 of those girls who are still in captivity. No one knows whether they are alive or dead. The hope is that they are alive and they will come back. Now, it's 10 years since those girls in Chibok were abducted. There was an international outcry, literally all over the place. So you can see them today converging to say a prayer to God on the possibility of the deity of God intervening in their situation. Maybe we'll take a listen and I'll introduce my guest. We still demand them, how so, whatsoever they are, whether they are, uh, have 10 or 20 children, the girls, they are our blood. We need them to be out. You know, uh, adoption has been made in Dachi, uh, in Zamfara, in Kaduna, and all these students, all these girls, they have been uh, released and you need them with their parents. Why is it our own be exceptional? to mark almost 10 years today in the Kahan of captors is something to be cautioned. That's why we are cautioning government. We need these remaining girls. Aisha Mohammed Ayyubo, the founder, CEO of Maltala Mohammed Foundation, and Kof Convina, the Bring Back Our Girls Movement, joins us on the program. Madam, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Good evening. I don't know how it feels that, how does it feel to be having this conversation 10 years after? I think it's really unfortunate, exceptionally sad. I cannot imagine that 10 years after this is what we're talking about. And for me, it's actually evidence of um, systemic failure. Not only are we talking about Chibok girls mm -hmm. 10 years later, in the last 10 years since Chibok, we've had over 1,700 children abducted from their schools in Nigeria under our watch. And, um, you know, it looks like these kidnappings are now actually escalating. There's no possibility of them abating. No one has faced justice. No one has been brought to book. So there's a raging culture of impunity. So it's sad enough that 10 years later, we're marking Chiba. But when you think about this, this culture of impunity that seems to have overtaken our land, you begin to wonder, our children are our most valuable asset. How is it that we cannot keep our children safe in our schools? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I'm sure that you, you are in conversation. We've seen some of them on that particular clip. Our uh, correspondent was there in Chibok, I think, yesterday and today, uh, and sent in, uh, filed in that report. And uh, for the people you've been talking to, especially the parents of those who are still in captivity, uh, what are you telling them? What, is, what do you hear from them? What are they saying? Maybe walk us through what the conversation is like with them. Okay, so the conversation is every time we have a discussion, you try and share a message of hope. But in reality, 
if when even when you share a message of hope, they say to you, okay, so what's where's the roadmap? Look, we've been at this for um, 10 years. In, in between, after the first girl surfaced in, um, after two years in captivity, that was in 2016, we brought back 128 girls, right? The largest number was when we negotiated for 21 in 2016 and another 82 in 2017. But since then, the girls have been coming in in trickles. We acknowledge, yes, there are times when the Nigerian military raids um, Boko Haram camps and they find amongst the girls that they bring back Chibot girls. But what is the plan? Today we have 91 girls still in captivity. So that's the first thing. And the parents keep asking, all right, we know that um, there are 91 girls still in captivity, but what is the plan? There is no plan. We don't have any plan as to how the remaining will be brought back. You'd have thought by now would have connected the dots, would have figured out at least where the majority of them are. The sad news is that at least a third of those girls have died. Some of them from air raids. Um, some of them have died from um, giving birth. Some of them have died from snake bites. And of course, there was a lot of starvation and hunger. So that's also a, a, another issue. The third issue that we're facing now which um, is a really traumatic um, situation, is the girls who have chosen to stay with their husbands that they came back from captivity with. So you have a situation now where the parents are wondering, OK, what exactly? Because again, it goes back to we don't have a post-abduction protocol. What is the plan for the government for, the, for their children? For their grandchildren who have been brought back, did you know that 34 children were, have been born in total to the Chibok girls? And those are the ones that are back. So we don't have a number for the ones that are still with Boko Haram. So what we are talking about is, as far as I can use, if I can use a word to describe, it's just chaos. And so how do you help people learn to cope when there's so much chaos? The reason I'm asking that question is because I can't imagine being in any situation. No one should imagine being in a situation of perpetual hope, no closure, and all of that. So what does this say about our value for human life? Or is it that the Nigerian society has just moved on? So it's, it's, a, it's a multifaceted, multifaceted problem, sorry, right? In terms of, yes, we have a, an approach where if we cannot... Um, deal with something when we a, a situation is exceptionally traumatic, it's very easy for people to dissociate themselves from it and move on. But we shouldn't be allowed to do that because if they were our children, I ask myself that question every day. If anybody that is in a position of authority, if those children were their children, would they be able to dissociate that easily? So that's a question we need to ask them. The other question is that, in truth, I think what has happened is that people are a bit fatigued. And the reason why there's fatigue, again, is because there seems to be no plan. If there was a plan, at least you can say, OK, this is what is happening. This is what the government is doing. This is what the military is doing. This is what the police is doing. And then it gives you some kind of confidence and comfort. So I think that's the other thing. The, uh, the third element is that kidnappings have now become so rampant that you're still wondering, which one do I even want to avert my mind to? Is it Chibok? Is it Dapchi? Is it all the ones that have happened in the last um, 10 years or so? We don't even know where the next one is going to be. And it just goes back to the same thing I've said. It's systematic. It's system failure. And if you have system failure, you know, it's really hard to get people to focus um, on a solution. So it's clear uh, if we have over 90 of them still in captivity, the Jonathan administration could not bring them, those ones back. The Buhari administration could not bring them back. Now we have the Tinubu administration, which is almost a year in, in, in the works. Uh, has, has there been a conversation being opened with this administration to at least, since it's a young administration, to say, okay, what plan? You've mentioned repeatedly that there is no plan. Have they approached them to say, what is the exact plan you have for these girls? Can you give us a timeline? What's the approach? Has there been any of such conversation? Not as far as I know, but um, two or three days ago, you know, we did encourage the parents to write. So they've written a letter to the first lady 
asking her as the mother of the nation to get involved with this matter. I think it would be a, um, great or wonderful if there would be an opportunity for the parents to meet with her so that she can give them that confidence that this administration is going to do something. I think there has to be much more communication. I know that the Borneo state government has recently issued a couple of communiques around the matter. But you know, we cannot just communicate when we need to respond, when there's a lot of pressure. We've had 10 years to come up with a plan. We need to have a plan. What is the plan? Now, the plan doesn't have to be full, full um, sorry, um, foolproof, but at least there has to be a plan. So in terms of opening discussions with this current administration, I hope the opportunity of the letter that the chief of parents have written to the first lady will start another series of discussions around what it is that is going to be done. I think 91 children are way too many children. And I want to tell you that for every one Chibok girl that we're looking for, we're talking about at least another nine to 10 girls that have been abducted from other communities. So there are lots of children out there that we cannot account for. That's the first thing. When Boko Haram used to return them in the early days, they used to bring them back in truckloads. So you can imagine, obviously, there are some villages where they must have just ransacked them. Till today, we're still talking about Zana Mubati School. This was about a year after Chibok. 500 women, children, and boys disappeared. To date, there's no sign of them. We cannot live in a country where we cannot protect our people. We cannot live in a country uh -huh. where we cannot protect our young people. It is criminal. We have a, look at the education indices for Nigeria. You know, Nigeria has almost 20 million children out of school. Now you have a situation where in more areas of Nigeria where it's actually very challenging to persuade people to send their children to school, you now have this kind of safety. We're destroying the future of a whole generation of children. So uh, be, as we begin to wind down, uh, one of the things I've, I've always wanted to find out from those of you who have their ears and listen to them is... How do they feel when uh, there was a time some persons were even saying it's a hoax, no girls were abducted and all of that? Uh, what was it like for them knowing that this is their reality and barefaced people are denying it? So let me tell you, between um, 2014 and today, 48 parents have died. Okay. Wow. Three were killed by Boko Haram. The rest of them died from ailments that are tied to high blood pressure, stress, and all of that. So you, first you need to understand that. One of the most heartbreaking ones was the one that died just a couple of months ago. In the Chibok girls, there are four families who have lost two daughters each. Okay, Only one family has actually recovered any, and those two came back together. One came back, I believe it was in 2016, and the other one came back about two, three years ago, five years ago. Part. A few months after the second girl returned, her father died, again, from a, a, a similar kind of ailment. I think that alone tells you the kind of stress and pain that these um, people are, are, are on the, uh, undergoing, that they're having to, to deal with. And then, of course, there's the stigma that has now been attacked. Those who come back with children are stigmatized. Their children are stigmatized. Those whose children have not come back as stigmatized. They're called mothers of Boko Haram daughters because they say that their daughters have chosen to stay with their captors. So what we're dealing with is a lot of stigma and a lot of pain. But that it didn't happen, I don't know why anybody is still saying that. In 2015, before the first girl returned, when everybody was saying it didn't happen, what the foundation did, the Mutala Mohammed Foundation, of which I'm CEO, we sent Journalist, this was in the heat of the insurgency, by the way, a cinematographer and a photographer. And we said, you know what, go to Chibok and document the stories of these parents. They met with parents of 210 girls in the various communities. All the local government wards are part of Chibok local government. Now that has formed the um, base, uh, 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 um, it was from those um, testimonies that a book has now been produced. And as the girls were coming back, we could actually validate the stories that the parents had told us and the narratives are with the, the, the narratives of the girls themselves. So it is real, it happened. Yes, the numbers are struggling. It is frightening to imagine that 276 girls 
could have been taken from a school. Even the 91 that are missing, I tell people, if you entered a, a, even a forest, are you called that, you cut 91 trees, everybody will know that that forest was there, not to talk of taking right. human beings. Thank you. All right, ju just the last one on this. Um, I know it can be a bit of a fatigue, uh, staying on something for 10 years, but not giving up is one of the virtues that we all should have. This government has campaigned on renewed hope. So if you were to speak to the president directly right now, on behalf of those parents and your group, what would you be telling President Bola Tinubu? What I would tell him to do is to bring back the remaining tuberculosis and actually to make it a policy of this government to bring back as, as many of the women and children and even men that have been abducted by Boko Haram. I think that should be their policy. In the case where we have lost girls who have died, let us account for each and every one of them. It's time for some of these families to have closure. But more importantly, they need to have hope. If there's a plan, let them develop a plan and let them communicate that plan. Two plans, one for rescuing the, the remaining girls, the second plan for a post-abduction um, protocol. We need to deal with the trauma you know, that you know, has been unleashed by um, these girls being held captive. They've been forced to marry. As far as I'm concerned, you know, rape and sexual has, assault has gone on. And like I remind you, 34 babies were born as a result of these girls being in captivity. And just to end with what you started right. with, some of the girls were as young as 13. You can imagine a 13-year-old girl who is now back 23. She spent half of her life with terrorists. That is not a good thing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program and for bringing your thoughts on this. Aisha Mohammed, your Yebode, founder and CEO of Motala Mohammed Foundation and co-convener of Bring Back Our Girls Movement. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And that's it on Sunday Politics right here on Channels Television. Thank you so much for your time and, of course, your usual company. I'm Jeffrey Ozama. Have a great week ahead. Good night. <laughs>